ha ha
Good morning. Welcome to Hampton Congregational Church. We're an open and affirming congregation, and we welcome everyone. And I would especially like to welcome you on this Pi Day. Now, that's not Pi Day 314. This is the actual apple, cherry, apricot, peach Pi Day, nationally accepted. So when you go home today, have a piece of pie. Enjoy. Well, in continuing our discussion of symbols in the congregation, in the, in the church, in our sacred space, our worship space, uh, today I wanted to mention a little bit about stained glass. Stained glass windows are often memorial windows, as these two are in the front of our sanctuary. And they also are always stories or windows that tell stories or lead to stories. Now, when you look at, at this story over here, there is obviously a biblically themed window. When you look at the one over here, it's obviously a biblically themed window. And it points to something. Perhaps for the people who gave the window, it was a particularly poignant story and meant something to their family. Or perhaps as they look at it, it brings comfort to them as they think about the one who it is in memorial to. I was down in Groton at the church down there for a little while, and they have this great big window <laughs> in their sanctuary. And it's not a memorial, well, I, you would say it's a memorial window, but it's, it's a, not a biblically themed window. It's the story of Avery, the Avery family who founded the church. And in founding that church, uh, they also were members of the founding family of Groton. And so it's something that grounds them and grounds that church and says, we are here, these are our roots. Now as we look at the windows throughout time, we see stained glass windows in early Roman architecture. They're not big, they're small. It wasn't until into the Middle Ages that stained glass began to be bigger as they found ways to create the glass, stain the glass, and hold it together within the architecture. So we have some of those great cathedral windows in Europe. Most of them that we know of that have survived are simply design windows because you know as Protestants, when we started the Reformation, we thought that things like pictures were not good. And so they destroyed anything that had a face in it. So now we just have the design windows that are left and they're beautiful. I'm sure some of you have seen them. But what do they mean? How do they, how do they influence our faith? And what do they bring to our faith? Well, first off, they bring beauty. And they show part of God's creation in beauty. But they also bring about that story for me. How do I relate to Jesus teaching the children? Am I a child? Or do I think of it as Jesus welcoming my children or grandchildren. What other things do you think about? How many of you, well, we get, we get used to things, and so we don't notice them. But how many of you often find yourself staring at the windows when my sermon goes a little too long or gets a little too boring? And what do you think about when you're looking at that window? What part of it is there? I used to sometimes attend a church in Iowa that had stained glass windows up in the balcony area. All, all of these windows, like in our balcony, would be filled with stained glass. The problem for me was that there was one circular part of the window that had a wheat, uh, a bundle of wheat in it. And it was this gorgeous yellow and gold and reddish tinge window. And 
I hate to say it, but my friend's sermons could not compete with that window. I would find myself staring at that window and just enjoying the beauty of it. So they're symbols. They point to something beyond. For me, the wheat pointed to the generosity of God within my life and within the life that I was living in Iowa. What do these stained glass windows point to for you? And as you think about that, let's worship our God. Good morning to everyone in the meeting house and you all in your virtual meeting houses. Please rise in body or in spirit. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. And night to night declares knowledge. Let our voices sing praise to God, creator of heaven and earth. Let us affirm our faith, the foundation of our life and hope, in saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Young at heart, even if you feel old of body. Good morning. So, I have a subject that I'd like to discuss with you. And it's a person. I would like to talk to you about Jesus today. What do you know about Jesus? He died for us. Anything else? Well, okay. So let me give you a little recap of, of Jesus. Number one, he was born and his dad was a carpenter. All right? Your dad doesn't build anything, does he? Come on. That's a lot of things, right? Yeah. So, in a way, he's a carpenter. So, in that way, you have some common things with Jesus. Dad builds things. Yeah. Now, when Jesus was growing up, he went to the temple. And he was talking with all of the teachers at the temple. And you know what he said? We don't know what he said, but they decided that he was pretty smart. Jesus is smart. Are you smart? Come on. Say it out loud. Yes. Yeah, you're smart, right? So again, there's some, something in common with Jesus. Yeah. Jesus grew up, and we don't know exactly what he did for about 30 years. 30 years old. That's really old, isn't it? No. You're supposed to say no. No. That's not old, you know, because I'm older than that. The dad's older than that. You don't want to be old. But yeah, 30 years. And then he got baptized. Have you been baptized? Yes. All right, so another thing you have in common with Jesus, you've been baptized. Now, one of the things we believe about baptism is that in baptism, we recognize something that you have received from God. And in the scripture, it says Jesus received that too. You know what that is? Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? You have the Holy Spirit. Your dad has the Holy Spirit. These people have been blessed with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus was blessed with the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that he did was he paid attention to what the Spirit wanted him to do. All of us try to do that also. Sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we're not. Like, for instance, when I was growing up, I tried to be good. You try to be good? Yeah. The issue for me was I had an older sister. Do you have an older sister? Yeah. They can lead you astray sometimes. Yeah. My older sister's name was Susan. And the thing about it was that she really was a good person, too. But I was a younger brother, and so I liked to tease Susan. Do you like to tease your sister? Well, we don't know if Jesus liked to tease his brothers and sisters, but we know he had them. So we know Jesus knew about sisters and brothers. But we know we have in common with Jesus. And we know he tried to be good. And he did that by helping other people. Do you help other people? You do. So you too have something in common with Jesus. Okay, so this is what I would like you to begin. You can begin now saying, how can 
I do good things for a Jesus kid? How can I be helpful to you? How can I, and this is a big word, you may know this word, show compassion. Show compassion is. All right. So, I invite you today to think about that. Maybe you look at one of these stained glass windows while I'm talking here. I don't know, do you have one of those packets with color in? I know there's some out in the foyer. If you need to go get one, go ahead and go get one. And as you think about that, think about Jesus and the fact that Jesus is our friend, Jesus is your friend. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus. Thank you for the help he lends us. And thank you that we can try to be like him. Helping other people and showing love and compassion. Amen. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for that very helpful introduction to this next reading. Our reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May the Holy Spirit guide our understanding of this scripture.
I know all of us here want to thank the trustees for bringing heat to our lives in the meeting house after last Sunday when we had no heat in here and everything was was cool. Somebody asked me if I had, had shortened my sermon last Sunday so that we would only be here for so long, and I said yes. And then they asked me, well, does that mean you're going to preach twice as long this week? And the answer is, no. No. I always say what I want to say, except when I shorten it. I, sometimes I leave things out. But today, it's sort of, sort of the end of an arc in our time in Epiphany. This is the third Sunday of Epiphany, the season of Revelation. And today we have another revelation of who Jesus is. What, what was the purpose of this gift to us? If you remember, it began this year in what we call year C. It began with a wise man. The wise men came and they came to the house in Bethlehem. They brought gifts and they welcomed the one who has been born King of the Jews. And so we learn Jesus is King of the Jews. It is revealed. Then at the temple, we read the story of Jesus as a teenager going to the temple, hanging out with the, the people who are smart, who were educated at that time. And we heard that all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers, and that Jesus increased in wisdom in the years and in divine and human favor. We hear, this guy is smart. This guy understands life. This guy is worth listening to. Then he becomes baptized. The next Sunday we read about John baptizing Jesus. And John says, well, I shouldn't baptize you. And Jesus says, no, we have to do this right. We're going to do this in an orderly and decent way. I think that was the beginning of the Presbyterian church. John baptizes him. Jesus comes up out of the water. The spirit comes down in bodily form upon him, according to our revelation. And God's voice says, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. We now know Jesus is God's son. And the next Sunday, last Sunday, go to the wedding. And Jesus shows up with how many disciples? Five. Okay, five names, four names, one unknown disciple. And his mother says, do something. Make this a party. And Jesus says, well, okay. What we learn about this from the Gospel of John is that Jesus is able to do signs. He is powerful. He is able to, to manipulate creation and to bring about good things. Now, we also read just a little bit of chapter 1 where we found out that there were, quite previous to him doing the sign, John had listed 16 titles, 16 names for who Jesus was. So we know who this person is. We know who Jesus is. And now today, we hear that this person, God's son, is filled with the power of the Spirit, and he has come. What has he come to do? He has come to deliver good news. He has come to deliver release. He has come to deliver sight. And he has come to deliver freedom. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this scripture was fulfilled at that time. Now, for us today, that doesn't seem like much. And we still know there are captains, and we still know there are oppressed, and we still know there are blind people. And we still know that along with the good news, there is bad news. 
So what is this? What is this revelation about? Well, according to the scripture, it's about Jesus being the Messiah, and according to the traditions, the year of the Lord's favor is the year of Shalom. It is the year when everything goes back to its innocent state. It is the reordering of culture and the reordering of relationships so that the behavior, the dissonance is all removed. For us, that sounds wonderful. It sounds like the kingdom of God. Well, that it is the kingdom of God, the realm of God brought to earth. But it also is something else. It's something that, that we actually fear. It's change. It's change. My old ways are going to be changed. How I relate is going to be changed. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I'm right. I know my opinions are true. And I know that I'm the most important person in the world. That's what my ego says. Jesus says, wait a second. This is about the year of the Lord. It is not about you. It is not about your opinions or your truth or anything that has to do with your ego. It is about God. And in God's year, it is the year of Shalom, the year of fullness, the year of compassion, the year of reconciliation. It is about the revelation of God for us. So today in our scripture, we hear what the picture is. We, we could paint the picture, right? In fact, I've, I've seen that picture in stained glass. Jesus in the synagogue reading the scroll. We, we can see it in our mind. What we have trouble with is hearing it in our being. That, in fact, as we live this revelation, things will change. And that we can be a part of the kingdom of God. Well, the scripture also asks a question. And the question that for me is important. It's the question that actually we talked about a little bit earlier. And that's how does Jesus reveal himself within your life, my life? Things to be heard as we read this. And as we think about what we've experienced in scripture over the last few weeks. And it needs to be considered, to take it, be taken seriously. Do I experience Jesus directly? Like my friend Roy, Ray Doherty, who was convinced that Jesus appeared at the end of the impossible event and said, Ray, get well. It's not your time. Get busy. Have that experience? Do you experience Jay through the relationships around you? Through the person? you live with, for the people you work with? Do you experience Jesus through the actions and attitudes of those around you, whether they're friends or not? Do you experience Jesus through the church, through the gathering here, through the music, through the symbols, through the reading of scripture, through prayer? We experience Jesus through your own actions, through the commitments and intentions of your own life. Do you experience Jesus through the presence of the Holy Spirit? Do you feel that presence? Now, I was once told that you should never ever end a sermon on a question. And so I have to 
ask Dr. Gunnerman's forgiveness because as I would want to end with this that question. How do I, how do you experience Jesus in your life? And may the Holy Spirit guide you in your awareness to the, this question's answer and to the growth of this question within your faith. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. You can share signs of peace with those around you and those who are with us virtually. They well greeted up there. <laughs> we hope so. We hope the peace of Christ is with us with you all. Are there any announcements or any uh, messages you would like to share with us today? Yes, Karen. Karen, can they bring the hats and gloves here and we'll take care of getting them? Here. The uh, John, the Catholic John, and Judy had to go back to the hospital. She had a little bit of infection in one of her uh, incisions, and so she went back in for IV antibiotics. But other than that, she is doing well in her recovery from the surgery. Any other announcements? Well, the gift of heat is a good offering today, and so thank you to the trustees. The gift of time that the deacons give is a wonderful gift to the congregation. The gift of music and our choral people, wonderful gifts that, that we have. The gift of speaking our readers give to us. The gift of technology that we have in the congregation both here on the floor of the meeting house and up there in the balcony. We thank all of you for your gifts and we would like to bless them. Let us pray in our prayer of dedication. Eternal God, accept these temporal offerings and bless them that in this world your love may be shared with all people. Let us now join together in prayer.
Listen to your hearts. Slow that we listen to your breathing and deepen it. Listen to your mouth and fill. Listen to your soul. This is perfect. Gracious and loving God, your patience with us is amazing. We humans seem so recalcitrant and obdurate. The song, When Will They Ever Learn, comes to the world and seems to ask the eternal question. And the answer often seems never. Once again, we hear the sound of strong men, strong men of the world that want to rattle their weapons and threaten death and suffering. So we ask that you hear our plea to save us from ourselves. And here are many brothers and sisters who pray for peace. We ask your blessing on the many medical workers who again have given their skills and energy to help us heal as the Omicron COVID spreads throughout our population. Grant them the energy and inspiration to keep on keeping on. And we would ask your healing presence with the members of our congregation who find themselves in physical or mental distress. We pray that the relationships that people find themselves in would be ones of health and wellness and wholeness. And we pray for the transformation of those that are. As the temperature drops during this winter time, our spirits are raised up in gratitude by the generous offering of service by your by our congregation's leaders and members. Keeping a church, our congregation, together during this time of mass and social distance, when the very act of gathering may cause sickness, is indeed a challenge. And so we ask that you bless them and renew their spirit. And now, O oh Lord, we ask that you would hear the names of those whom we hold in our hearts. Ruth. God, through our prayers of love and compassion, as we request your presence with those whom we do hold dear. And now we ask that you hear us as we join together as generations of Christians in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Father, who art in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would now invite you to rise in body or spirit and join in the singing of our closing hymn, number 770. of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our reconciliation, our Redeemer, and our friend, go with you into this new creation. Amen.